Bay Area beauties may have kissed the Raiders' playoff hopes goodbye for 1981, but as the season winds down, they are getting a closer look at the faces of the Raiders' future. Men like quarterback Mark Wilson and tight end Derek Ramsey, number 84, whose 66-yard scoring play helped build a 21-14 lead over San Diego, a lead the Raiders failed to hold. The Oakland secondary, a source of pride a year ago, fell victim to a record performance by Charger tight end Kellen Winslow, number 80. Beginning in the second period, the Chargers scored on six consecutive possessions. During that span, Winslow caught 13 passes for 144 yards and five touchdowns. Winslow's five scoring catches are the most by any receiver since Bob Shaw caught as many for the Chicago Cardinals over 31 years ago. All told, quarterback Dan Fout set a team record by throwing six touchdown passes. And San Diego's 55 points equaled the most ever against Oakland. And the Chargers' record improved to 7-5, and five, within range of division leaders Kansas City and Denver. While San Diego is still in the hunt of the AFC West, the Cleveland Browns are about to put out the fire and call in the dogs in the AFC Central. The Browns have lost their magic of recent years. As a result, they occupy the cellar of their division. Against arch-rival Pittsburgh, Brown quarterback Brian Sipe set a single-game team record for futility by throwing six interceptions. Three to Steelers safety Donnie Shell, number 31. Steelers converted two of their interceptions into touchdowns and found strength in two men who brought them to the top so many times before. Quarterback Terry Bradshaw, number 12, and running back Franco Harris, number 32. Franco's 111 total yards and a touchdown were complemented by several unlikely receivers. One was Rick Moser, number 39, primarily a special teams performer. The other, 250-pound tackle Ray Penny, number 74, who lined up at tight end and scored his first NFL touchdown. Steelers 32, Browns 10. With veterans fueling the stretch run in Pittsburgh, rookies have made the difference in San Francisco. First round draft pick Ronnie Lott, number 42, burned the Rams with a 25-yard interception return to score his third touchdown of the year. Lott was upstaged by another rookie, the less heralded Amos Lawrence, number 20, whose nickname Famous may be revived following this 92-yard kickoff return. The Rams were hardly humbled by 49er rookie returns and stayed even through much of the contest behind quarterback Dan Pastorini and Wendell Tyler, number 26. Matt Hayden, number 11, replaced Pastorini at quarterback in the second half and rallied the Rams into the lead in the fourth period. Touchdowns by tight end Walt Arnold and Wendell Tyler put the Rams ahead by one with a minute 51 remaining. 
But Bill Walsh's 49ers did what first place teams have to do to stay in first place. They rallied back 61 yards in the final seconds to the Rams' 19-yard line, where kicker Ray Wershing delivered the game winner. The 33-31 win solidified the 49ers' lock on first place in the NFC West. San Francisco has not been to the playoffs in nine years. But in 1981, the 49ers are no longer prospecting. They are about to strike it rich. To star in the NFL, an athlete must overcome all possible obstacles, and last week, Jack quarterback Richard Todd proved he was a star of gallant proportions. With New York vying for first place in the AFC East, Todd played every down with a cracked rib and bravely stood up to a blitzing Miami defense. With Miami applying constant pressure like this second quarter safety, the Jet offense could only muster three field goals in the game's first 57 minutes. But Todd went on to prove he was the man for the moment. With New York trailing 15-9, Todd masterfully moved the Jets downfield. Todd guided New York to Miami's 11-yard line, and with 16 seconds remaining, he found number 83, Jerome Barkham, open for the winning touchdown. After six years of famine and ridicule, Todd had led the Jets to their most important victory in the post-Namath era. By beating the Dolphins 16 to 15, the Jets moved into a first place tie with Miami with a 7-4 and 1 record and are now on the verge of their first winning season since 1969. After being treated as the AFC's doormat for years, these rejuvenated Jets have become a team of Cinderella charm. For the Colts, midnight had struck a long time ago. But with players like number 27, Curtis Dickey, there are still remnants of a once potent cold offense. Unfortunately, Baltimore's offense has to share the field with a cold defense, which gives away more cheap acreage than a Florida swamp tycoon. Cardinal quarterback Neil Lomax took advantage of Baltimore's generosity. With big pass plays like this 75-yard dash by Pat Tilly, number 83, the Colts were in trouble all afternoon. And when St. Louis handed off to running back Otis Anderson, matters got even worse. Anderson helped guide St. Louis to a 35-24 win and a game closer to the 500 mark. Another team that was closing in on an even record were the Detroit Lions, but a quick sideline pass by Eric Hipple seemed to put all that in jeopardy. A touchdown interception by number 25 Todd Bell cut Detroit's lead to 9-7 at halftime, but Bell's 92-yard gallop was by far Chicago's longest play of the day. A tenacious Detroit defense grounded the Bear passing game to negative 20 yards and held Chicago to a team record low 24 total yards. Such a poor offense prompted Bear head coach Neil Armstrong to later comment, we even looked bad getting out of the huddle, and it went downhill from there. But going downhill has not been the case for the Lions, who went on to win 23-7 and clinched their fourth victory in six games. Much of that success has been attributed to quarterback Eric Hipple, who ran in one touchdown from five yards out. Hipple is one of several players around the league who have risen from rarely used substitutes to star status. Such was the case in Buffalo when the Bills called upon number 25, Roland Hooks. Hooks came off the bench to score Buffalo's lone touchdown in the first half, but Patriot running back Andy Johnson proved he was also a sub of big play capabilities. Johnson's 56-yard touchdown pass marked the fourth time that he has thrown an option pass for a touchdown this year. His efforts helped build a 17-13 New England lead. 
And when Buffalo took over with 35 seconds remaining, the Bills looked for their super sub. Hooks took the Bills inside Patriot territory, and when succeeding plays failed, Buffalo was forced to throw up a desperation pass with five seconds left. Hooks again stole the limelight. By nailing down a 20-17 victory, Hooks ended Buffalo's two-game losing streak and improved the Bills' record to 7-5, just one half game behind the Jets and Dolphins. With capable men like Hooks coming through in a pinch, using bench warmers may become the league's hottest trend. At the start of the season, many thought it was time for 11-year veteran Ken Anderson to enjoy pro football from an easy chair. However, Anderson is currently sitting pretty as the NFL's number two ranked quarterback. Against Denver, Anderson kept the Bengals in the driver's seat using players like Pete Johnson, number 46, who recorded nearly 150 yards of total offense and scored two touchdowns. Defensively, Cincinnati furthered the Broncos' position as the most sacked team in football by knocking Steve DeBerg out of the saddle four times. The Denver defense may be number one in the NFL, but precisely thrown passes to sure-handed receivers on Sunday win more football games than Monday's statistical rankings. Anderson pillaged the Broncos secondary, completing 25 of 38 passes for 396 yards, the second highest total in his career. The Bengals signal caller also threw for three touchdowns, including a 65-yard completion to running back Charles Alexander, number 40. Cincinnati accumulated nearly 600 yards of total offense, and its 38 points were the most scored this season against the Denver defense. The Bengals' 38-21 win boosted their record to 9-3, the best in the AFC, and assured Cincinnati of its first winning season in four years. But just as importantly, the win proves to Ken Anderson that he still has a few steps on opposing defenses as well as father time. While Anderson proves that experience is a good teacher, inexperienced signal caller Rich Campbell has a lot to learn. The Packer rookie's 1981 debut was marred by four interceptions as he continuously threw into double coverage. Number 34, Cedric Brown's 81-yard touchdown return sparked the smoldering Buccaneer offense to a 24-point second quarter. More points than they've scored in each of their last six games. Facing the Tampa Bay attack was former Olympic hurdler James Owens, number 26. Owens, a wide receiver turned halfback, rushed for 112 yards on 16 carries. Doug Williams also directed the Bucks to a score with this touchdown pass to number 83, Theo Bell. Tampa Bay's 37-3 win was their best offensive performance of the season and left them only one game behind the Vikings in the NFC Central Division. It appears the Bucks' offense is back on track. However, their end zone antics still seem a little out of sync.
hosting the Seahawks. Kansas City also tuned up for the final leg of the playoff race with their best offensive show of 1981. Number 86, J.T. Smith's touchdown and an interception return by rookie Lloyd Burris, number 34, both late in the first half, took all the excitement out of the finish. The Seahawks did muster a Jim Zorn to Steve Largent touchdown pass. However, Seattle's passing game was no match for the NFL's number one ranked running attack. Against the Seahawks, Billy Jackson and James Hadnot, number 48, proved that someone else in Kansas City can run with the football besides Joe Delaney. Hadnot rushed for over 100 yards, and Jackson, number 43, scored two touchdowns in the Chiefs' 40-13 win. The victory lifted Kansas City to an 8-4 record and a first place tie with Denver in the AFC Western Division. Even an all-star cast like that of the Philadelphia Eagles is capable of botching a performance. And last week against the New York Giants, that's exactly what the Eagles did. Prior to last Sunday, Philadelphia had beaten the Giants 12 straight times. Last week, New York's tough young defenders exacted a measure of revenge. Foremost among Philadelphia's problems was New York's rookie linebacking sensation Lawrence Taylor, an exceptional young defensive football player. In a game dominated by the giant defense, it was only fitting that one of its members should make the game's decisive play. The moment belonged to number 24, cornerback Terry Jackson. His 32-yard touchdown clinched a 20-10 giant victory, an important one for New York. For not only did it end Philadelphia's six-year domination over the Giants, but it also kept New York's wild-card playoff hopes alive. In Dallas, Tom Landry greeted news of the Giants' upset win with great enthusiasm. His job was now clear. By beating the red-hot Washington Redskins, Landry's Cowboys could move into a first-place tie with the Eagles. Given the Cowboys' incentive, Washington never had a chance. Doomsday set the tone early. Defensive end Harvey Martin powered into the pocket virtually unchecked and Redskin quarterback Joe Theismann was lucky to survive the encounter. While Washington was flattened offensively, Dallas's attack was innovative in its strategy and flawless in its execution. Dallas rolled up nearly 500 yards of total offense, and frustrated Redskin defenders had no answer for the Cowboys' finely tuned, multifaceted attack. Butch Johnson hauled in Danny White's first touchdown pass. Later, Wizard White's favorite son threw a second. This one to tight end Doug Cosby that proved to be the game's clinching score. Chalk up another win for the guys who wear the star. The Cowboys 16th straight win at Texas Stadium. Down in the Lone Star State's other pro football arena, Houston welcomed home one of its favorite sons, former Oiler coach Bum Phillips. As his old team was being introduced, Bum couldn't help but applaud a group of men he coached for six fine years and who twice came within one win of going to the Super Bowl. But Bum's new team, the New Orleans Saints, 
hardly share Bum's sentiments. To them, Earl Campbell was just a big fullback who had to be stopped if the Oilers were to be beaten. Offensively, Bum's new team blew through the Oilers like wind through a screen door. George Rogers had another 100-yard rushing day. And number 45, Jack Holmes scored a couple of touchdowns as New Orleans built an early lead. In the second half, the Saints padded their lead on a soft toss from Archie Manning to running back Wayne Wilson. The Oilers battled back briefly in period four when Ken Stabler surprised the Saints with a 50-yard pass to rookie wide receiver Mike Holston. But the Oilers' comeback fell short, and the Saints went on to win 27 to 24. After the game, Bum's old players lined up to give their best wishes to a man they all know and love. The Oilers are now five and seven, and for the first time in three seasons, are not serious Super Bowl contenders. But even in defeat, they still show deep respect for the man who led them to the brink of greatness. Bum Phillips came and conquered last week, and he departed the Houston Astrodome as always a hero.